If you have your copy of God's Word, turn with me to Psalm 27. Psalm 27, I'll be reading out of the Christian Standard Bible. So if your translation differs just a bit, that's okay. If it differs a lot, see me after class. The psalmist David writes, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom should I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Whom should I dread? When evildoers come against me to devour my flesh, my foes and my enemies stumbled and fell. Though an army deploys against me, my heart will not be afraid. Though a war breaks out against me, I will still be confident. I've asked one thing from the Lord. It is what I desire. To dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Gazing on the beauty of the Lord and seeking Him in His temple. For He will conceal me in His shelter in the day of adversity. He will hide me under the cover of His tent. He will set me high on a rock. Then my head will be high above my enemies around me, and I will offer sacrifices in his tent with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Lord, hear my voice when I call. Be gracious to me and answer me. My heart says this about you. Seek his face, and Lord, I will seek your face. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not leave me or abandon me, O God of my salvation. Even if my father and mother abandon me, the Lord cares for me. Because of my adversaries, show me your way, Lord, and lead me on a level path. Do not give me over to the will of my foes, for false witnesses rise up against me, breathing violence. I am certain that I will see the Lord's goodness in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart be courageous. Wait for the Lord. Father, we thank you this morning for the opportunity we have to gather together in this place to lift high your name in song, to open your word, to read your word, to hear your word proclaimed. Father, in the presence of the Holy Spirit, each and every one of us have gathered for the purpose of seeking you, of worshiping you, of praising You and of desiring, Father, this very morning to be shaped and conformed into the very image of Your Son, Jesus Christ. I pray that You would give us eyes to see, that You would give us ears to hear, and that You would give us hearts to receive Your Word this morning. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It is, it is an honor uh, to be with you guys. I've, I've been in Dallas all week with the Southern Baptist Convention, but it was, it was not a painful drive to come over this morning uh, with my family uh, along for the ride. My uh, four boys are with me this morning. My daughter was not quite feeling up to it, and, and it's perfectly okay to not pass the test of naming them because every time one of them gets in trouble... I failed that test as well. Uh, what I want to ask you is, have you ever found yourself in, a, in an absolutely, entirely hopeless situation? Have you ever found yourself in a point in time or in a, or a point in space where you've realized that this has all gone south and that you're really limited? by how you can respond to this. Several years ago, I'll never forget, uh, I was on a mission trip. I had just preached at the only evangelical Christian camp 
in the, uh, in the nation of Belarus. And on our return trip from Belarus, we decided to stop by and spend a few days in Prague. And in Prague, as you might expect, everything is not in English. Perhaps it's the Texan in me, but I probably wasn't expecting that as much as I should have. Now, there was a, a tram line that went back and forth in front of our hotel that I won't dare try and pronounce for you, but I, I remember jumping on the tram thinking, well, it goes both ways. Sometimes it goes this way, sometimes it comes back, so not a problem. Well, it was 100 degrees. It was the worst heat wave they had seen in some dozen years while we were over there, and being that they're not used to Texas-style weather, they don't have air conditioning, and so their hotel room, which was a very nice four-star hotel, did not ever have air conditioning, which meant my room was 92 degrees. It was not a happy day. So we're tired, it's the end of, end of the week, we're almost home, I was trying to decide if I wanted to sit in the airport and do standby and try and get home a little bit earlier. But a friend of mine and I decided, well, well, let's jump on the tram, we'll go down a few stops, let's find somewhere with an ice-cold Coca-Cola. Now, some of you have already said, David just lost his Texas card because he said Coca-Cola and not Dr. Pepper. That's okay. I'm willing to bear that ridicule and scorn if that's what, if that's what it is, right? So I wanted to find an ice-cold Coca-Cola. So we went several tram stops down. We found a pizzeria with ice-cold Coca-Cola. Glass bottle, it was glorious. We worshipped. And we jumped back on the tram. And it went the wrong way. And it kept going the wrong way. And we thought, well, it's going to go back. Surely it'll turn around. Nothing else is going this direction. This is the red line. The red line goes back by our hotel well, it kept going the wrong direction and then we hear those famous words when a train comes to the end of its run that's it everybody off <laughs> we're at the station we're parking it for the night so we're scheduled to be leaving the hotel at four in the morning to go to the airport to fly home and my friend and I find ourselves at midnight on the other side of Prague, which as I found out was the wrong side of Prague, pretty much every Taken movie takes place on that side of Prague. And we're marching from like sign to sign, bus stop and tram stop to tram stop, trying to find any name look that looks familiar to one close to our hotel. It took us hours and hours to march across the city of Prague in the middle of the night, sometimes through backyards, sometimes with dogs chasing us. I think I saw Liam Neeson once. It was really, it was one of those situations where there was no, no one to call for help. Pre-cell phone days, or at least pre-international data days, we didn't know the number to the hotel, couldn't pronounce the name of it anyway. It was. It was just a bad deal. It was find your way home in the dark as best you can. Just, we just weren't sure what to do, so we just had to figure out as best we could. Have you ever found yourself in a similar situation? Maybe it's not on the far side of Prague. Maybe it's just the wrong side of Dallas. Maybe you've, you've, you've crossed out of the glory land and you found yourself in Louisiana. Have you ever found yourself in that situation where you're just helpless? I don't know the stories that came in through the doors this morning with you. Like, I don't, I don't know what's going on in your life. It's one of the, both the benefits and the downsides to preaching in a, in a pulpit supply guest manner is... I don't have a relationship with you, know, a relationship with you to put my arm around you and to know what you're walking through. And yet, what I'm confident of is that each and every one of you are walking through something right now that you feel helpless about. Or you just walked through something during which you felt helpless. Or, 
it's right around the corner and you don't even see it coming. That's, that is the nature of this world. What I know from God's Word is that there is a hope for us this morning found in this simple psalm. And so what I want us to do is to look together and to read where it says in verse 1, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom should I fear? Look at the psalmist David's description here of the Lord. He's saying that He is my light. Throughout Scripture, that's a picture that we're shown of who God is. In John 1, He is the light to all men. He is the very source of their existence. The fact that you move, breathe, have breath, and exist is because Jesus Christ is the light of your existence. In John 8, He's called the light of the world, clarifying that the life given to those Clarifying the life given to those who follow Him. The light shown to those who follow that light and serve Jesus Christ. God is described as the light. In 1 John 1 it says that God is light and in Him there is no darkness, no no darkness at all. Exemplifying the purity of who God is. And in Psalm 27 we see kind of this picture that encapsulates all of these. He is... David's life. He is David's salvation and he is entirely pure. The Lord is my light. He is my salvation. Whom should I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Whom should I dread? Whom should I dread? And in just a couple verses, David shows a confidence that I fear many of us lack or we skew. We show a similar confidence that doesn't necessarily fit David's confidence. Who should I fear? Whom should I dread? David here has a, has a holy swagger, right? This is not a false confidence. This is not a, a false uh, swashbuckling bravado that stands in the face of what comes though he may not have anything at all. He has the light and salvation of the Lord. So he has a, a very holy strength and confidence. The great British preacher Alexander McLaren said that he thinks David here is recalling standing before the giant Goliath and he's, he stands there and says, if I'm not scared of him, if I'm not scared of nine feet of raw muscle, if He doesn't scare me, because I have God, of whom should I be afraid? You see, David's confidence was never in his own abilities. His confidence was never in the strength of his arms or, the, or the, his skill with the slingshot. His confidence was in the Lord. His confidence was not in the five smooth stones that he set in his patchel. His, his strength is not in his necessary abilities or whatever some, someone may recommend that you have to have in order to be successful in business or in life. His, his confidence was not resting in his own wisdom or his own cleverness. cleverness. His confidence rested in the Lord and in the Lord alone. Though an army deploys against me, my heart will not be afraid. The war breaks out against me. I will still be confident. Which means it's worth asking then to you and I, where is your confidence? Where does your confidence lie? Are you resting in your skill at work? In the skill of your mind? In the skill of your hands? In the, in the winsomeness of your personality? Are you resting on the nest egg and security that you can fall back on should it all blow up? Where does your confidence lie? Let's take a page from David's notebook. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom should I fear? 
A real confidence. Not a, not a feigned, hollow confidence, but a real, substantive confidence. Which begs the question, how do you know? How do you know if what you're holding on to is real and substantive or if it's hollow? How do you know? By asking the question, if what you were holding on to was all you had, would it be enough? Would it be enough? That's where David goes. Look at verse 4. He says, I have asked one thing from the Lord. One thing from the Lord. This is what I desire, to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. If he had nothing else, he asked for this one thing. This one thing. Some of you will remember this very, very dated illustration in a movie called City Slickers with Billy Crystal. I know I did a PhD in preaching, but sometimes you do a super outdated illustration. And the curly encouraged him. You've got to learn this one thing, the one secret to life. And he said, well, what is it? And the guy died before he could tell him. David said, I desire one thing, to dwell in the presence of the Lord. You see, not only does the light save in verses 1 through 3, but the light satisfies. In verses 4 through 6, his heart's desire is to be in the presence of the Lord. And there are other Christian groups and denominations that have a different view of this. This is so different from the, from the Quaker or the Evangelical Friends view of an inner guide where they refuse to observe communion, the Lord's table. They refuse to do that. Rather, they would opt to commune with the Lord in a spiritual manner on a daily basis, but they don't take of the physical elements. And so they talk about this leadership of the inner light, which began with an emphasis on the leadership of the Holy Spirit, but has kind of morphed to this day of being some sort of leading from the interior of all men, not just believers, outside and without the guardrails of Holy Scripture. And as such, it's devolved in a lot of cases to really nothing more than paganism. Now hear me, there are, there are friends and Quakers that we would call brothers and sisters in Christ, but there are also some that we would not. And it's because they're seeking satisfaction in their experience of something and not in, in the light itself. His his, David's desire, was not longing and experiencing this deep light within, but to be in the presence of the light that existed outside him. As I read something online the other day, we're being taught so often and told so often to go with your gut and to trust your gut. Some of us have anxiety. And our guts generally say, abort mission, run away now. That's not always what we're called to do. The Bible says the heart is deceitful. Let's not trust our heart, let's trust in Him who has given us this light. I remember some years ago, early as a young married man, serving as a music minister at my very first church in the backwoods of Louisiana. And I knew the path from where I went to school to the church. I knew that path. I could drive that in my sleep. But one Thanksgiving, we had a community-wide service, which meant we drove another 15 minutes to another church. And I helped lead music there. And then as 
I am prone to do. I hung around to the very end shaking hands and talking to people because I'm never the first one out the door. My kids will tell you to their frustration. I'm usually one of the last people out the door. Well, there was a problem. We had followed people to this church. And this was before the days when you could just pull up your phone and click, click, and be on your way. We had followed people to this church, and all those people had left. And so the lights turn off, and my wife and I sat in the car and looked at one another and realized we were hopelessly lost. And so we began trying to backtrack the way we came. And I generally have a decent sense of direction when I've had coffee. There's a story there. This isn't the time. I'm generally decent with directions, a good sense of direction. But we looped around the backwoods of Louisiana on these two-lane oil-top roads. And frankly, the brightest light was the gaslight on our dashboard saying that we were running very close to being on fumes. And I just remember praying, God, can, I, can, you, can you just create a gas station around this corner? That would be really nice. Be really nice. A street light, just something so I can get my bearings and see the top and see the ground, you know, because it's just the headlights of this 1992 Dodge Dynasty, it was, it, was, it was not the best situation. But I remember just praying and being desperate for just a little light. That desperation is David's desperation here. I'm just, I, one thing, one thing I ask, to be in the presence of the Lord, to dwell in the house of the Lord, to gaze on His beauty, to seek Him in His temple, to be concealed in his shelter on that day of adversity. You see, in the presence of the light, there's protection. And when there is protection, then we can demonstrate gratitude, right? My head will be held high above my enemies around me. I will offer sacrifices in his tent with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. So, so what David is saying here is that, yes, he is He is being protected and sheltered and in the presence of the light, in the presence of the Lord. And as a result, he is praising and worshiping his God. There are sacrifices and songs before the Lord because of the satisfaction that comes from being in the presence of the Lord. And it's different from the earthly things that we desire. Have you ever... Have you you ever desperately wanted something, begged for something, thirsted for something, only to receive it and then to be left dissatisfied? Or as my kids call it, Christmas? No, that's not true. I try really, really hard for that to not be true. But have have you ever desperately longed for something, grasped for something, reached for something, worked for something, sweat for something, bled for something, and finally got it in your hands, for it to leave you empty? For you to have put everything in it. Maybe it, was, maybe it was a new house, and you get the new house, and then something happens, and you realize that's just different problems. Maybe it's a new job and you realize that the the people at that other job weren't the problem. Maybe it's Chinese food. Really, really good. And then 30 minutes later you find out that you're still hungry. That That was gonna do it. And it just left you empty. David says here in the psalm that that is not what the Lord is like, that He offers eternal satisfaction, that He is eternally satisfying, completely satisfying, which means that we never run out of worship to offer or praises to give. We never run out of songs to sing. You can sing from hymn number one to the back of the book and there are still songs to go. Which is why we get 
an eternal worship service at the end. We will never run out of songs to sing. He satisfies completely. You see, the light saves and the light satisfies. Number three, the light secures. The light secures. You say, David, all of those sound the same. You're using S's. That's right. You can take the boy out of the Southern Baptist Church. But sometimes you can't take the Southern Baptist out of him. In verse 7, notice that the tone of the psalm shifts. Lord, hear my voice when I call. Be gracious to me and answer me. You see, the tone shifts from one of David's confidence to David crying out. It it shifts from his swagger to supplication. He says, hear me. Be gracious to me. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn me away. Do not leave or abandon me. And in verse 10... He clarifies that David's requests here are not empty. They're not vapid. They're not hopeless. That there's a substance to his desire. Verse 10, even if my father and my mother abandon me. And it is an indictment on our society that this does not shock us when we read it. Can we just say that out loud? This is intended to be an argument from the lesser to the greater. Of course your mother and father would never abandon you, is what the author's saying. But even if it got to that extreme, the Lord would never, is what David's saying. Even if it got so bad, so unbelievably, incomprehensibly wicked, that your father or your mother would abandon you, The Lord cares for you. David says, the Lord cares for me. These are not feeble petitions to a cold and distant and uncaring God. These are not mere cries before an unfeeling sovereign. His petitions before the Lord are rooted in His confidence that God will answer. His petitions and His cries are grounded in His understanding that the Lord cares, though all else fails, though it got as bad as it could possibly be, even if mother and father abandoned him, that the Lord cared for him. You see, there is security in the presence of the light. But there is desperation outside it. How many times, friends, How many times have you found yourself spiritually crawling on your knees, groping in the dark, searching for something to take hold of, desperately in need of the security of the light? How many times have you felt life deal you a knockout blow that you find yourself stumbling around looking for something, anything to to grab hold of and to stay on your feet? How many of you have experienced that in your life? I'm confident that if we took the time, if we grabbed a side room, and if we just walked in one after another, almost to a person, you'd be able to tell me what it was that you walked through, that that's how you would identify it. Whether it was a phone call in the middle of the night, whether it was a diagnosis that you were desperate to avoid, whatever. And you find yourself in that point where nothing else will hold you up. The recent spate of suicides among those whom the world would consider to be the most successful and as having everything they could possibly want or desire proves yet again that only the light of salvation can provide the necessary security to face what this 
world offers us. And our constant surprise that even they would suffer debilitating depression or desperation or could be driven to something as drastic and extreme as suicide reminds us again of our own proclivity to believe that satisfaction and security could possibly stem from anything apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. The light offers the only strength that gives us the ability to stand and face the day. So the light saves the light satisfies, the light secures, and the light strengthens. David's life was filled with adversity. His life was filled with conflict, was filled with moments where everything went wrong. And those kind of experiences for a lot of people can lead them to wander further away from God because they're distracted by what they are dealing with. But David gives us a fantastic example to follow in that his enemies and adversaries actually drove him closer to God, not further from Him. They drove him closer to the Lord. He would go before God for direction. He would go to God for protection. He would go to God for vindication. Look at verse 11. Because of my adversaries, show me your way. Direction. Lead me on a level path. Do not give me over to the will of my foes. For false witnesses rise up against me, breathing Violence. What kind of danger do we find ourselves in when we start seeking direction, provision, guidance, and vindication on our own and from our own selves? It's easy to know that He's our protection and our defense in our heads. It's easy for us to quote verses when we run into problems. How much more difficult is it to feel it? For it to make that forever long trip from your head to your heart, how much harder is it for you to go from, yes, God is my strength, to being, to feeling strengthened by the Lord? Does that distinction make sense? I want to I make sure that I'm not making a distinction that no one is following. I just... I find myself concerned that so many of us have the right answers. Within reach. And yet how few of us take that and grip hold of that and cling on to that, and we will reach out to anything else. David, in verse 13, returns to the very source of his confidence. I am certain that I will see the Lord's goodness in the land of the living. And then he says four words that so many of us need to be reminded of. Wait for the Lord. Wait for the Lord. You see, I think that the point that that God wants to drive home for each and every one of us this morning, that what He wants to show us, what He wants us to get hold of, is that when conflicts arise, and when the darkness begins to close in, and when hope is fleeting, we can be confident that in that very moment, 
His light will pierce the darkness. That at just the right time, when you have reached that point, when God has placed you at that moment of desperation so that you have nothing else to take hold of, that you are in just the right time place for the light of His presence to break through and for you to be able to experience in that moment the strength and the security and the satisfaction and the salvation of the Lord. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart be courageous. Wait for the Lord. Wait for the Lord. Psalm 27 is a hopeful psalm. Wait for the Lord. But let's acknowledge and be real and be frank enough in this room to admit that sometimes that hope, our hope, is not answered in this life. Can we admit that for a second? Sometimes you will wait for the Lord, wait for the Lord, wait for the Lord, and you will pass through the gates of death before you experience His deliverance. Can we be honest about that for a second? I'm not trying to bring you down. But I want us to be clear. Sometimes it's not answered in this life. Years and years and years ago, after hearing the deaths of two of the earliest African missionaries, a man named James Hannington became the first Anglican Bishop of East Africa. And no sooner did he arrive in Nyanza, which is at the intersection of Tanzania and Kenya and Uganda, he was seized and imprisoned by the king of Buganda, a, a kingdom within Uganda. In his imprisonment, he was consumed by fever. He was delirious by pain. He was eaten while alive by vermin of various sorts. And he was facing in each moment an imminent death. And his last journal entry says simply, I am quite broken down and brought low, but I am comforted by Psalm 27. But I am comforted by Psalm 27. 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation. The next day, October 29, 1885, he suffered a martyr's death and was stabbed from both sides with spears. And in the midst of such darkness, his hope was not in his earthly deliverance, but in his heavenly deliverer. And that's the light that pierces the darkness. Take this, take this to heart. In the midst of the worst that this world has to offer, you find yourself in the very presence of God. When you don't find deliverance on this side, there is complete deliverance on that side. When the worst that this world has to offer, when the storms rage, the winds howl, and it all crashes down, we who call upon the name of the Lord can live with such confidence that we will one day rise in His presence. May God give us that confidence. May God give us that hope. Let's pray. Father, we, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for the, for the rawness for the raw emotional edge of the Psalms. 
and how you communicate to exactly where we are in our lives. Father, I pray for each person in this room. There are struggles that I can't begin to understand. There are sorrows that no one else knows. But we are confident that according to your word, you know our needs before we even give them voice. And that even when we can't provide the words to pray, your Holy Spirit intercedes on our behalf and prays for us. And so, Father, as a, as a body of believers, we do. We weep with those who weep. We rejoice with those who rejoice. We want so desperately to come alongside those who are struggling so that we can give them the strength that we know comes from you. Father, give us the patience and the perspective to take the comfort with which we have been comforted and to share that with those who are suffering. And for those who do not have the hope that we have, let us extend that to them and share with them your marvelous grace. Your desire to rescue them, to heal them, and to deliver them from even what they are experiencing in this very moment. And we don't always understand why we walk what we walk through, but we trust you. We trust you. The Lord is my light and my salvation. We will wait for the Lord. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.